All right, guys, let's get our Bibles open to 2 Corinthians Come on, bro. chapter 2. Amen. So there's a, a lot going on in the Corinthian church, and Paul is addressing quite a bit. And even in the first part of chapter 2, we find he's talking about being grieved or grieving other people. And a lot of that is actually in reference to the person that was disfellowshipped. If you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there was somebody that was actually put out of the fellowship of the believers wow. because of their unrepentant sin. Yeah. Um, you know, and you can go back and read that chapter. It's, it's kind of grotesque, actually. The, yeah. the level of sin that that person was in was, like, pretty impressive. Uh, the, the problem, you know, there's always going to be sin. You know, like, we're sinners. Amen? Yeah. So the church itself is not perfect, even though God is perfect and his body is perfect. Uh, once we showed up, we kind of ruined that a little bit. Amen? Yeah. Uh, but we're striving for perfection. We're striving for completion. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're striving to do what God is calling us to do. And I really appreciate Mary's uh, sharing for communion. Because she talked about what her life was like before Christ. Uh, and we can all relate. And then she got baptized. It was awesome. The Eccles pool. Amen. The, the famous pool right there. And then uh, she did well for a while, but I really appreciated how she shared uh, about some of the deviations, some of the kind of the missteps, some of the bad decisions. Uh, and it's true. You know, the Bible says there's a way that seems right to a person, but in the end it leads to death. While those who want to be successful in any endeavor will seek much advice. Uh, and there's no greater endeavor than that uh, of going to heaven. Amen. Amen. It's ultimately why we're here. We want to go to heaven. Yeah. I want to be with God forever. Uh, so uh, that was that was really awesome. I was, in it, but there was so much victory because then she shared about how she repented, Amen. and then Ralph became a disciple. Uh, raise your hand if Ralph invited you to church. Look at all these people. Uh, you know what? That's incredible. So let's come on now. Give, give, give it up. Then Adrian Natar became a disciple. So uh, it, it's just been incredible, you know, and it, honestly, how did that happen? Well, because uh, our sister Heather Cameron, who now is in San Diego, she was being a little faithless. So then Anthony Elizabeth discipled faith back into her. Yeah. Amen. And then Heather repented and went to campus and shared her faith and met Mary. Wow. That's how it works right there. Uh, so there were issues in the church. There are always going to be issues. You know, the Bible talks about the, uh, the there's there are allegories or uh, basically like what happened in the Old Testament teaches us about what's going on in our lives currently. So the Old Testament reality, the physical reality, foreshadows kind of the New Testament spiritual reality, yeah. right? So what happened in the Old Testament? Well, the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. Egypt. We're like, Egypt? <laughs> Can I phrase it in the form of a question? Uh, so the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, and then they were uh, saved by the blood of the Lamb mm -hmm. and baptized into the Red Sea, right? So they were slaves, they were freed, they go through the Red Sea, and then most people think it's from there onto the Promised Land. But what happened is they wandered around in the desert for 40 years. Now, now it says that the reason why they wandered, it was actually a, a trial period. God had put them in the desert to test them to see what was in their hearts. And it's not because God doesn't know what's in our heart. Amen. It's usually because we don't know what's in our heart. And God wants all that junk and all that gunk to get, to get purified and to raise to the top so that we can be cleaned out. Amen. And get ready to go to the promised land. So for us, we were slaves to our sin. Of course, thanks to the blood of the lamb, we were freed. We were baptized. Amen. So you see that allegory. And then most people think the church is the promised land. But in reality, we're walking around, we're wandering around this desert called life. And we're, we're still in a, a trial period. God is testing us, isn't he? And he says, listen, your shoes never wore out. Your bread never became moldy. I gave you everything you needed. But the test sometimes made it really revealed some of the cracks. It really showed where we were, you know, dependent on ourselves and not dependent on God. And the same thing is happening uh, in our lives today currently. So uh, we know that we're kind of in the, the desert wanderings. We're on our journey, right? We're on our pilgrimage to cross over River Jordan, which is when we die. 
You know, in the world, when you die, it's a tragedy. In the kingdom, when you die, it's a glory. The Bible says precious in the, in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. So that's why funerals in the kingdom, yeah, of course, there's sadness because you miss that person that you love so much. But truly, it's a celebration. It's, it's an amazing worship of God to say, wow, uh, really, that's the goal. That, that's the end goal. You know, for you Bible talk leaders, we, uh, you know, our church, we function in small groups. And each group has a Bible talk leader. We call them Bible talks. Amen. We got the burning bush Bible talk. How do you do it? We stay lit. Okay. We got the source Bible talk. We got the AMS Bible talk. We got the tribe called Christ. Who am I missing? We got Adamas. Illuminati. No, I'm just kidding. No, it's Diamond, Diamond. Rockefeller. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, we got Great Band of Survivors. And we got Lydia. Amen. There they are. See, man, uh, you know, we, we function in small groups. We're working together. We're trying to make it to heaven. Uh, this is uh, super duper important. I forgot why I brought up the Bible talks. Amen. My life is like, <laughs> you know, long days and short nights. Uh, and that's just kind of, I guess that's just what they call life, amen? Uh, I'm sure it'll come back to me. Does, Christine, do you remember why I brought that up? Yeah. Work in small groups? Yeah. Getting to heaven. Oh, yeah, thank you, Nicole. <laughs> I should do this on, I actually, I'm doing this on purpose. I'm just testing you to see if you're paying attention. See that? <laughs> so the goal of the Bible talk leader, it can, it can feel like we got to baptize somebody, or it can feel like we got to get missions in, or it can feel like, hey, you got to show up, uh, you, know, you know, to church, amen? Uh, but really, the goal of the Bible talk leader is to get themselves and their people to heaven. Amen. Amen. That's the goal. And I think that helps us a little bit because it's a little bit of a long game at that point, right? Uh, now, there are some indicators, like if you go to the hospital, which is kind of what the church is like a little bit. Uh, what do they do if you, anybody ever been admitted to the hospital? What's the first thing to do? Check your vitals, right? It is your, <laughs> check for insurance. <laughs> That's the truth, isn't it? Oh, Lordy. <laughs> uh, background check. <laughs> A federal background check. It check, is your heart pumping blood, essentially, right? Are you still alive? Because if you're not, well, do they keep dead people in a hospital? No. Send them to the morgue. And so the church is a hospital where we come, we're a little bit beat up, we're a little bit, you know, tattered. We might be like barely breathing. And we're brought in to be resuscitated, to be restored, to be healed, right? To be cured, essentially. Uh, but, they're, they're, you know, imagine... People die because you get a little bit sentimental in church. You feel like I, this person's not alive. This person is no evidence. There's no evidence whatsoever of this person's uh, life. The vital signs are flatlining, right? You keep that person. Do they take up hospital beds? Do they take up rooms? No, they get they they're removed. Uh, now it's not us who remove people. It's the Lord. Amen. amen. Our job is not to run people out of church. We want people to come to church. Amen. amen. Uh, uh, but the goal of the Bible talk is to get as many people to heaven as yeah. possible. So Amen. the Corinthian church had some issues. Yep. Uh, our church has some issues. Did you know that we got Zach Shahan, guys? I mean, oh. should have known. <laughs> you should have known already, you know. The person that invited you is really nice. They maybe will even uh, take you to lunch today. Uh, but they got issues. Amen. So I just want to let the cat out of the bag a little bit. Amen. <laughs> uh, sometimes we have issues with each other, can't we? So you can have your own issues. We all know you got issues. <laughs> but then what if you have issues with the person next to you, you know? It's challenging. <laughs> How are the marriages this morning? Amen. I went to the brother's house on Friday night. Oh! 
Whoa, baby. Uh, <laughs> bunch of single guys living together, man. <laughs> some issues. Uh, but uh, so Paul's dealing with some of those issues yeah. in Corinthians, you know. He says, listen, I don't want anybody to be grieved, you know. And, and uh, there was repentance in the church because they dealt with the sin. And actually, it's believed that the brother that was excommunicated, or rather disfellowshipped is probably more the biblical term, is brought back into the fold. Mm. Uh, the Bible does say if somebody is in sin and refuses to repent, there's actually a process. There's yeah. a way to deal with that yeah. with the ultimate goal of handing that person over to Satan. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. That's pretty intense, right? But what's the goal of that? Uh, why would you do that? So that the sinful nature can be destructed and destroyed, right? So that person realizes, dude, I do not want to go back to Satan. Uh, I like the kingdom. I like Jesus. Jesus is pretty awesome. I want to come back into the kingdom of God. And, and of course, then the door is always open right there, amen? Um, so that's what he's essentially addressing. Now, if you look at uh, first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We'll pick it up in verse 14. The title of the lesson today is Ministers of the New Covenant. Mm. Ministers of the New Covenant. And, uh, you know, of course, in our church, we believe in uh, what the Good News Network video talked all about. We believe in, in, in raising up people. We believe in putting people on staff. And, uh, you know, but it's God that determines uh, what our lives look like. A man or a woman uh, plots his course or her course, yet it's God that determines their steps, yeah, isn't it? Right. Amen. Uh, which, is, which is really important to understand. Um, so here, 2 Corinthians, ministers of the new covenant, what it, 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 I think it's essential for us to understand that really that, that would involve all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, that if you are like Mary talked about, a true disciple, yeah. if you're a biblical, like a biblically defined Christian, then you are a minister of the new covenant. Yeah, you know, word minister is the same root uh, word as administrator. Uh, really, what it is is you're a servant or an assistant. Mm. So our lives uh, are, are they consist of being a servant or an assistant to the ministry of reconciliation. Amen. That's uh, who we are by definition. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter two, verse fourteen. You guys there? Yeah. Can I get an I'll fly away? <laughs> He's so creative. I just. You know, right here, uh, Paul says, but thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ, and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are the stench of death, to the other the fragrance of of life. You know, this is an incredible passage of scripture. It's a, it can be a little confusing, uh, but we know that Christ is the conqueror who has vanquished his enemies, yeah. right? And actually, uh, his enemies, that's, that's us. Mm. Before we were disciples of Jesus, we were opposed to right. Jesus. We were opposed to God. We were objects of wrath, right. right? So we were not on the same team. Uh, we were not playing on the same side of the field. So it says that Jesus came and he conquered and vanquished his enemy. Wow. Now, we know how he did that through sacrifice and through love. Yeah. And it says that because he was triumphant, he leads in triumphal procession his train of captives. Now, it's really interesting because if you lived 2,000 years ago in the Roman Empire, this would make a lot of sense to you. Because any time uh, an emperor or a general in the Roman army would go out and conquer his enemies or vanquish his enemies, he'd come back into town with his train of captives. Mm. And there'd be a ticker tape parade for the conqueror. Wow. And it says that this is for us, Jesus. We are led in his triumphal procession. And you know, it's interesting because, of course, in that ticker tape parade, you'd find some of the prisoners of war. Some that would be unbelievably slaughtered and just handed over to then be thrown into the arena and be made a spectacle of. While others would be freed and actually at some point even become a Roman citizen. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. So, uh, you know, Cleopatra is famous for saying, I will never be led in triumph. He said, come if you will, but you'll have to kill me first. And she was haughty and she was prideful. And so can people be with Jesus. Yeah. They'll say, I'll never be conquered by Jesus. I'll never be led in triumph by Jesus. I lead myself triumphantly. You know, Marley talked about it. Are you trying to get God's blessing or are you just blessing yourself? You know, God will take care of all the things in your life when you make it your business. Like God, 
will make your life his business when you make God and his kingdom your business. When you say, you know what, God's going to be first in my life. The kingdom's first in my life. God is going to give you everything you need. And what I've found, uh, it, it, it is challenging to understand this. What I need is actually what I want. You know, sometimes when you go after things that you think you want, and then you end up like, man, that was not actually what I really wanted. You ever overeat? I just, last night, I just was like, I just feel like garbage, honestly. I just feel like junk. I just feel terrible. I thought I wanted that extra piece of pizza. I was wrong. That was not a need. If I eat what I need, some like, some lettuce, some kale, some spinach, some bacon. <laughs> I feel better. I've gone after what I need, not necessarily what I want. But then all of a sudden, like, actually, actually, that's, that's what I wanted. My body was craving something, and then when I fed it what it actually needed, I realized it was what I wanted. You know, when I put God first, I put his kingdom first, uh, I had a different plan. I had a different agenda. And then I came to church. It was about this size. They preached the word to me. I got into some Bible studies, and I realized, wow, I've been looking for God in all the wrong places. And when I decided to put God first, he gave me everything I needed. I then realized this was everything I wanted because really what I want is God. And then when you have that, when you're filled with God, when you're committed to God and you say, God, I'll give you everything I have. Whatever you decide you want to give me, I'm totally fired up about that, even if it's suffering and struggling and uh, et cetera. If it's just the cross, glory be to God. Amen. Amen. I'm fired up about that. That's when God gives you some of those desires of your heart. Amen. You'll never forget, uh, I, was, I was desperate to be in the full-time ministry. I mean, I was totally full of ambition as a younger man to be in the paid ministry. I mean, I was like going after it. And God just kept saying no. Like, it's not, no, you're, you're idolatrous. Uh, this has become your God. And the answer is no. He didn't say that audibly. You know what I mean? Amen. Yeah. 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 So, oh, amen. Jared. <laughs> uh, it was more just through a series of really frustrating events. Amen. I was like, okay, this is obviously, this is not working. Uh, sometimes when one door closes, they all remain closed. Amen. It's just not, it's not always like when one door closes, another one. It's like, there was just a lot of closed doors. And God was like, yeah, where are you going to go now, buddy? Uh, and then when I finally surrendered it, I remember I, I was like, okay, I'm going to, I moved from New York to DC. And I was like, you know what? I, I did not become a disciple with a carrot on a stick. I just want to be a disciple. I love Jesus. That's why I got baptized. I want my sins forgiven. He's given me that. Yeah. Everything else is a bonus. Everything else is a blessing. None of it is deserved. Mm. Yeah. Uh, not a single thing. The only thing I've ever really earned in my life is a one-way ticket to, to, you know, to hell, honestly. Yeah. Uh, yet, I'm, now I'm, like, I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit. I'm forgiven. I'm going to heaven. Yeah, People actually will like, they'll p- sort of put up with me. You know what I mean? They, <laughs> They like me. Every birthday comes around, they share about me, wow. you know. You know, and I'm like, man, this is incredible. Then once I finally said, you know what, I just want to go back to God. All of my dreams, all of the desires of my heart then came true. Wow. I mean, and I, I, at that time, admittedly, I was in a lot of sin as a disciple. I got open with all my sin, was totally transparent. I just like, I mean, and because it's not just the actions, it's the, the motive that you got to get open with. It's the heart. It's your thoughts. It's where you're really at before God. I got, it was full disclosure. Amen. It's talking to like, I was like, I got to get totally open. And then literally that day I was, uh, I was put into the full-time ministry in Washington, D.C. Wow. A year later, uh, Rachel and I got married. And God had, uh, what I had lost because of my idolatry, God gave, gave back to me because it was no longer about those things. It was about God. So how about it this morning? Are you being led triumphantly by Christ? Is Christ your king? Are you caught up in his train of captives, a prisoner of war? You know, they, uh, it, it, when this parade would happen, there'd be an abundance of incense burned. So the smell would just waft into the air. And of course, for those that were in the back of the procession, Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 4 how he's been put in the back of the procession, uh, condemned to die. Because those that were in the back of the procession were those that were relegated to be thrown into the arena. 
uh, to be mauled by wild animals as a, as a spectacle, while those in the front had the hope of life. Isn't that intense? Wow. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there's this incense of victory, and, and everybody can smell it. But to these two different groups of people, it means two different things. Mm -hmm. It's the same smell, but it's perceived in two different ways. We were at the Campus Devo on Friday. Yeah. And I thought about different scents and smells that kind of some people like, but other people don't. Yeah. Like, raise your hand if you like the smell of gasoline. Isn't that interesting? I love pumping gas. I'm just like, I don't know why. Uh, raise your hand if you like the smell of bleach. Corey. Oh, no. Isn't that interesting? It's, it's really interesting. Corey brought up a, an interesting point. He said, uh, wet cement. <laughs> it's, actually, it's true. No, there's actually, uh, you know, uh, pregnant women can oftentimes, uh, due to a lack of, uh, or like an iron deficiency, have this bizarre kind of like, it's kind of weird to call it a craving, but like, like for gravel or cement, there's like this, like there's this deficiency, which is similar to why people, some people like chlorine. Then some other people were like glue, and we all were like, ah, oh, bro, I don't know if that's a, I don't know if that's. A. I believe the children are the future. It's like, okay, guys. I don't going on here. Uh, <laughs> but God wants to use us. He makes us his aroma. And it says that we spread the aroma of Christ everywhere. You know, it's so important to understand about the Good News Network is that the aroma of Christ is being spread all over the world. We've got churches in over 50 nations. Our plan is within the next three years to have a church uh, of the sold out discipling movement in every state in the U.S., amen? Of course, we're fired up to be in Florida. Uh, but it says that the aroma of Christ in verse 15, for, for we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing, those in the front of the procession and those in the back of the procession. It says, to the one we are the stench of death, to the other the fragrance of life. Now, it's not determined by God where you're at in the procession. It's actually determined by your response to the gospel. And it says, you know, the true aroma of Christ, which is the word of God, when it is preached to those that are perishing, the kingdom of God, the movement of God, discipleship, his word is the stench of death. It's, it's obnoxious and it's off-putting. It's something where you're like, mm, oh, oh, disgusting. You know, something that really grosses you out. Amen. That's what the truth feels like and seems like to those that are perishing. Now, to those that are being saved, it is sweet, yeah. sweet fragrance. Are you with me? Now, I think as disciples, because our mission is to make more disciples and to get people to heaven, amen, as, as obviously we have no saving powers within and in and of ourselves. We can atone for no one's sin, not even our own. It's the grace of God. Yet God has commissioned us to go make disciples, baptize them and teach them to obey, amen, to get them into contact with the Lord. And, uh, you know, sometimes we can be tempted to try and modify the smell. So that it's pleasing to the people that, that we're studying the Bible with, or maybe even people we care about and love and our, our family and friends. We can kind of try to water it down a little bit so that it's more palatable and more acceptable. And, and we've all probably been guilty of this in one way or another, right? Uh, you know, but what happens when we do that, when we try to, to modify the smell to make it nicer to some or less nice to others, uh, to those that are perishing, it, it doesn't smell that bad. And they're given this kind of half-truth about God's word, a watered-down version of the gospel, which is a very real, uh, probably, illustration of what is kind of modern Christianity. Yep. What you find in most churches, what I certainly found, uh, both anecdotally just through experience in life, and then also just studying things out and getting the background of stuff. Instead of going to Google, you got to go to the word of God to figure out what's really happening, amen? Uh, you know, and, and you realize, like, wow, this, this, this is not really the full truth. This is not the full gospel. Uh, there's the prosperity gospel where you're promised a lot of stuff really without the commitment uh, uh, that the Bible is calling us to. 
So then the, the, when it's modified to those that are perishing, it, it's, it doesn't smell that bad. Yeah. But to those that would truly be saved, to those that really are, are hungering and thirsting for righteousness, mm. for the word of God, will be put off by that lukewarm kind of in the middle neutrality that sometimes we can desire. You know, Jesus was divisive. Not because he had a bad attitude with his leader, amen? He was divisive because he remained where God wanted him to and he preached the word. And it says, man, that, there, there's a polarizing effect that happens because Jesus didn't modify the standard to try to change the smell, because we don't change the standard to meet where we are at. Yeah. We change where we are at to meet the standard. Are you guys with me right there? To some it is life, to others it is death. To some it is, it is freedom and salvation, to others it is slavery and subjugation. Mm. And, and, and when you, you, you've, because of there's, there's a hardness of heart that comes in, People can feel like being a disciple or being a, a Christian is, is like being subjugated. Wow. It's like there's too much constraint or this is, this is too hard. This feels like slavery. Mm. Uh, but we subject ourselves to the slavery of Christ, uh, to slavery of righteousness, yeah. uh, because we know that in that there's freedom, yeah. which we're going to find here in a minute. You know, uh, when we preach the word, we've got to make sure we preach it the way that it is. Uh, it's not about us. It's about the Bible. Amen. So you don't have to be super duper intense when you preach it. You know, uh, you don't have to be super duper charismatic. Amen. You don't have to like cut little slits in your eyebrows like Aldrian. I think maybe that'll make you cooler. I probably would make me cooler. Amen. I need a lot of help. It's not hard to make me cooler because I'm so uncool. It's just like some slight modifications would help. Uh, I'm easy to work with, amen? Uh, uh, we just got to present the word of God and be hard line, as we say, you know, but hard line is just saying, hey, here's a standard. We're not going to move it. Yep. Yeah. I can't move it. I don't want to move it because I know it's by this standard. It's by the word that I was saved. Yeah. And I'm really grateful that the guys that studied the Bible with me didn't try to kind of like do a song and dance and try to modify it. They just, they just kind of gave it to me the way that it was. Yep. And I was really appreciative because that's what I was looking for. Yep. It was the fragrance of life. Verse 17 on, says, unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak therefore, uh, rather before God with sincerity, like people sent from God. You know, uh, it, it really what it, what it talks about peddling the word of God for profit, uh, the Greek says we don't corrupt the word of God. And really what this is an allusion to is like a, a bartender, really like a tavern keeper is kind of what uh, the, uh, the phrase in the Greek would allude to. That's how you would understand it. Watering down the, uh, the high shelf wine, the expensive wine, with some of the cheaper low sh uh, shelf wine to water it down. Why? To make a profit. Wow. To say, I don't want to, I want to, I want to mix things up. I'm going to dilute it. I'm going to cut it so that I can keep a higher profit. And Paul says, listen, we don't do that. We don't mix the gospel with any foreign entity. We just preach it, no chaser, amen? amen. We just, we present it as it is so that you have the opportunity. We don't want to modify it because when you make a true disciple, when somebody gets the aroma of Christ and it's the fragrance of life, that person's a world changer. That person's a neighborhood changer. That person's a classroom changer. That person is a, a, a place of employment changer. Yeah. They change the people around them, sometimes for good and sometimes for bad, because now they're spreading the aroma of Christ everywhere. Mm -hmm. They're not trying to necessarily make it beautiful. They're just saying, it is what it is. Yeah. I smell like Jesus. Mm -hmm. The reality is most people won't like it. Yeah. But then you'll find the ones that do. Yes. Yeah. And it is so sweet. And they'll forever, forever, ever be so thankful that you spread it that you just let it waft into the air now to be understood this is a spiritual concept so you don't actually you're not going to actually smell like jesus amen guys you actually have to actually talk to people amen you can't be like Yeah, we're gonna have, they're going to look at you like you're a weirdo, amen? Yeah. you got to invite them to Bible talk. you got to invite them to church. Yeah. you got to preach the word to them and study the Bible with them. This is what changes people. You know, Paul says, hey, and who is equal to such a task? It is us. Yeah. 
we are equal to the task, not because we're competent in and of ourselves, but because God has given us his competence. So the first point is the aroma of Christ, the fragrance of life or the stench of death. How about it this morning for you? Is it the fragrance of life or is it the stench of death? Point number two, sincere, confident, and competent. Look at what it says here in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, it says, are we beginning in verse 1 to commend ourselves again, or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everybody. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. You know, uh, this would be probably better rendered in many other versions. It says it was written on your hearts, not our hearts. So Paul is not saying, hey, uh, this letter of recommendation, this this." commendation is not uh, about what's on our heart. It's about what's happened in your heart and in your life. It says your heart is like a tablet on which God wrote his sign of approval. Wow. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. Now, who was the approval or what was it about? It was to approve Paul, who was God's man, preaching to them. Mm -hmm. He says, you are now the, my letter of recommendation. You are the proof of my ministry, and this should serve as proof to you. Yeah that you've been changed by God's word. Amen? Amen? You know, Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 10, it says, The Lord gave me two stone tablets inscribed by the finger of God. On them were all the commandments the Lord proclaimed to you on the mountain of the fire on the day of the assembly. So it says the Old Testament, Moses received the tablets, the commandments of God that were written by the very finger of the Lord. Wow. So he took these stone tablets and God inscribed his Ten Commandments in those stone tablets and gave them to Moses and he gave them to the people of God. Yeah. And now it says in the New Testament reality that your heart has been inscribed upon by the very finger of God. Amen. This is how you know that you're in the ministry of reconciliation. Yeah. You look back to that time when you were converted and you say, I know I changed. Yeah. I know I repented. There was a miracle at work. God wrote it on my heart. Wow. Yeah. On. You know, uh, this is super important. Luke 11, verse 20, Jesus says, if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then you know that the kingdom of God has come upon you. God has written on our hearts. You know, for me, sometimes I struggle. Can you relate? Yeah. Yeah. And when I struggle, I want to repent. At least I, I know I need to repent. And when I repent, I'm kind of brought back and I'm reoriented to that, that one moment in the beginning when I was baptized to say, I know I was converted. I love God. I love Jesus. Now, I've tried to mature since then, uh, but I'm reoriented around my hope in Christ. I'm brought back to my first love. Amen. I've got an anchor in my life that keeps me from drifting too far, and it's my hope in Christ. Sometimes when I get nervous, I get anxious, I get worried, I get, uh, you know, upset, or I feel like I don't want to surrender. I try to kind of raise the anchor, try to bring it up, and then it's like I got to drop the anchor back down because this is what keeps me grounded. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, in verse 4. You know, right here, it says such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He's made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. Not of the letter, but the, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Confident, competent, and sincere. Our confidence comes from God. Our competence comes from God. Where does it come from? When we are sincere before the Lord. Amen. You know, to be sincere is, is very powerful because it's yeah. just about being honest. It's about really recognizing where you're really at before God. Yeah. And for some of us, it's like, I know I got to, I know I got to go back. I know I got to go back to my first love. I know I've got to drop the anchor so I can, I can stay hopeful in Christ. I think for others of us, we've got to look at our, the process. We've got to look at our beginnings and ask ourselves, hey, uh, was there a true conversion? Yeah. Yeah. 
You've got to study the Bible and say, man, what am, what's my touchstone? Am I being re, do I have a place where I can go back and say, okay, all right, I feel back to, back to 100%, right? I mean, I'm good to go. I'm charged up. You ever have like one of those old devices in your house? And no matter how long you charge it, it just never seems to work. As soon as you take it off the charge, it's like dead again. Now with your current phone, you charge it up, you're good to go. Maybe a half hour, you're at 100%. And you got to ask yourself what your life looks like. Do you need to go back and, and restudy the Bible? Uh, do you need to study the Bible just to, initially with the person that invited you to say, you know what, I've been religious for a long time. But man, am, am I sincere? Am I competent? Am I, am I confident? And does that come from God? Yeah. Sincerity is really important. It's really powerful because it's just about being honest. It's about being truthful with, number one, ourselves, and number two, with God. Because yeah. you could fake other people out. Yeah. You could even deceive yourself. That's but right. But God will not be mocked. Yep, that's right. And I think it's important to kind of pay attention to some of the signals in our lives to say, okay, I've got to go to the word. I got to get some advice. I got to get some biblical counsel and make a radical decision for God. Point number three, unveiled faces with an ever increasing glory. Verse seven says, now if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory fading though it was will not the ministry of the spirit be even more glorious if the ministry that condemns men is glorious how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness for what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory and if what was fading away came with glory how much greater is the glory of that which lasts therefore since we have such a hope we are very bold we are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. But in their minds, but their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts, but whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the spirit. You know, right here, uh, it says that Moses' face was radiant after he spent time with God. Yeah. But it was a radiance that was fading. And then he would cover his face with a veil. He's kind of like put a paper bag over his face so that people wouldn't see it. It says in Exodus 34, 29 to 35, uh, turn there with me, if you will. Keep your finger in 2 Corinthians 3. Exodus 34, verse 29. It says here that when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken to the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them. So Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him and he spoke to them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near him and he gave them all the commands of the Lord uh, that the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with them, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak to the Lord. So what's incredible is that, you know, uh, that Paul says, listen, the reason why Moses covered his face is because the radiance was fading. So he didn't want the Israelites to see that this was a temporary radiance, that this was an insufficient radiance. It's likely maybe that even God, uh, through his sovereignty, moved Moses so that he would cover that uh, radiance and veil it so that those in, in the Israelite community would not believe. The Bible does say that God has blinded the eyes of unbelievers. And even when Jesus preached, half the group responded with yes, and half the group responded with no, and his preaching drove the wedge through it, right? Yeah. So, you know, what's incredible is that what made Moses' face radiant is not something that we search for externally. It's actually something that lives within us, in our hearts. Yeah. It is the very presence of God. So the now present radiance that we have as disciples is so much greater than the former radiance. It's a radiance that does not fade because it's not based on your righteousness. It's based on the love of Christ. 
and our belief and our faith in that love, which is then credited to us as righteousness. So it's not an external motivation. You know, sometimes you can come to church and you feel like, man, oh, thank you, bro. You can feel like you need some motivation, right? Like when the preacher's preaching, you know, you say like, And then maybe you want to clap for something you see in the GNM, but you're looking around to see if anybody else is clapping. And you do one of these like. You got to commit to those things. You got to like. You say, man, am I, am, I, am I motivated enough? Our motivation needs to come from within. It's got to be intrinsic. It's got to be deep down in our hearts. It, External motivation is not enough. I could get you, if because you're all at church, you're pretty much going to do what I say, man. So if I was like, stand up and just scream as loud as you can, you'd probably do it. I'm not going to do that, amen? Because you're like, oh, I'm at church, you know, I should probably do it, something like that, amen? But you say, but that's like cool for like a minute, and then it, and then it, and then it fades. Yeah. It disappears. The motivation has got to come from the word. It's got to come from the spirit. You know, it says that the ministry uh, brought death, the Old Testament. Isn't that intense? Yeah. The ministry that Moses led, that he brought down the, sta- the tablets, that ministry brought death. This is the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Mm-hmm. The old ministry and the new ministry. You know, in Exodus 32, verse 28, Moses, when he was coming down from the mountain, what happened? They had uh, built an idol in the form of a golden calf, which was led by Aaron. They were worshiping and praying and celebrating that idol. And then as a result, 3,000 people died that day. The day the old ministry began, 3,000 people died. Exodus 32, verse 28. The day the new ministry began in Exodus 2, 38, 3,000 people were baptized. That's the difference. Death and life. How did they live in in Acts chapter 2? When 3,000 people were baptized, it says they, they were devoted to the teachings. They were devoted to prayer, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread. They were filled with awe, and they were so excited about what God was doing in their lives. You know, the uh, term fade away shows up quite a bit here. Uh, Verse 11, it talks about it here. It says, uh, and if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? This is actually a a poor translation. We're not the uh, NIV, International Christian Church, amen? Amen. By and large, probably the best version of the Bible you can use, but you got to go back and look up the Greek and and do some searches right here. Fading away kind of sounds like there's this process of fading away, but really the Greek word denotes something being done away with or abolished. Ended, and there's a very clear ending that happens. Amen? When you're converted to Christ, there needs to be a full abolishment of your old life. There is no process in repentance. In the Bible, there's no such thing as repenting. There's either repent or I already repented, amen, and I'm fired up. Now, the, the fruit of repentance in Acts 3.19 is times of refreshing. When you truly repent, you will be so fired up. Uh, in the video, I don't know who said it, but they, they talked about uh, uh, joy is the fruit of being surrendered. And I got to look at my life. Hey, am I, fire, am I joyful this morning with my relationship with God? We, we can't add Christ to our life. As Nick points out in Colossians 3, Christ is our life. Amen. So we don't, we don't fit Christ into our discipleship where he kind of like, you know, it's like we're just going to, you know, or fit Christ into our life, fit discipleship into our life where it's nice and convenient. Hey, I'll come on Sunday. I'll come on Wednesday. You know what I mean? I'll even show up sort of to Bible talk. Are we still doing Zoom? You know what I mean? Oh. Camera off. Oh. Maybe you forgot you were unmuted for a minute and said something. Oh. So I'll come to all the bare minimum meetings of the body so I can tick my box. That's what the Pharisees did. That's how they lived. Wow. Are you with me? Yeah. We can't add discipleship to our lives. We, we add our, our life to discipleship. We kind of take our lives and we fit it in where we can get it in with the Lord. Amen. Amen. And if Jesus is like, nope, sorry, you're sticking out on the edge right there. It's like, I got to cut you off. I got to shave you down. I got to mold you so that you fit in perfectly with 
God's plan. That's what the call is this morning. Amen. You know, verse 12, it says that there's a, a boldness that we have, but there's a dullness that comes when we're veiled and we haven't abolished our old life. We're seeing an incomplete picture. You know, Moses' radiance, the same word shows up, it wouldn't fade. It was meant to uh, foreshadow the abolishing of the old ministry. This ministry is, is temporary. This radiance is temporary, and it will be done away with. But the veil prevented the Israelites from seeing the temporary nature of the radiance. Thus, uh, they, you know, people that are religious but not devoted still can't see that it's empty. Remember when, before you became a disciple and you were like, you're trying and you feel like you have good days, yeah. but it's not complete. Yeah. It's not complete. You know, for some of us, our old lives or maybe our current lives are still veiled. Yeah. So it's like, wow, things still look good to you. But then the after effect, the, the reality that this life is really empty without Jesus right. is still veiled. On, yeah. Like you still can't see the full picture. Yeah. It's still a half picture. Therefore, there's a, a, a mighty struggle. You know, this is, a, you know, it can kind of show up where you feel like there's still some juice to squeeze out of the fruit of life, mm. where you're still kind of pulled by your desires. And, you know, people like, I want, st it shows up kind of like, I want, well, I just want security. I just want stability. I, I just, you know, this is a lot. I got school. Yet all of us know we've all found the time and the money and the resources that we needed when it came to what we wanted in the world. Yeah. I, had, I had time for, for what I wanted to do. Yeah. But then Jesus is like, hey, do you have time for me? Yeah. You know, maybe you've deliberately put the veil back on. Maybe you're like, I, I know this isn't true. It's kind of like in uh, The Matrix where Cyrus sells Morpheus out yeah. and he says he's eating this steak and he's like, I know this isn't real, but it tastes so good. Yeah. And he says, I don't want to remember anything. Make me somebody famous, like a, like a movie star. Wow. Yeah. Maybe we've done that. Maybe you've been duped by Satan and kind of deceived and the veil is back on. But the Bible offers us a promise this morning. Yeah. He says, only in Christ is the veil removed. Amen. And there's an unveiled face with an ever-increasing glory that comes from sincerity to say, I've got to examine my life this morning. Ask some tough questions. Yeah. Be sincere. And then the confidence and the competence will return. Yeah. You know, it says here in uh, um, verse 18, we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Mm -hmm. All true disciples behold the Lord. Yeah. And the idea here is that you're looking into a mirror. That's kind of the phrasing, right? Now, a mirror, it's so cool. Like, we have these mirrors, and you can see yourself really well in those. Or like the HD uh, video this morning. Wasn't it cool? It's pretty yeah, crisp, yeah. right? Uh, but ancient mirrors would be just pieces of metal. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes, like, you wouldn't, be, you wouldn't get a super clear picture. You'd have to kind of fix your, your eyes and, and gaze directly for a while until you're like, all right, I think I look okay. Amen. But I'm not sure about some of the other spots. Yeah. You know when you're trying to cut your own hair because you're trying to save money to give to missions? Amen. Sometimes when I shave my head, like I'll miss like a little patch in the back. It always gets me. I'm like, I need a bigger mirror. And Jesus is, listen, when we behold the Lord, when we fix our eyes, when we gaze directly and steadily at Jesus, with an unveiled face, knowing, hey, at the end of the day, I know I need the Lord. Yeah. At the end of the day, whatever God decides to give me, I'm going to be fired up with. There's an ever-increasing glory, and you get the real image of Christ. And then you reflect that image of Christ to all of those in your path. You know, only in Christ is the veil removed. And what's incredible is that when Jesus died, the temple curtain, the veil of God was torn in two. And now we have full access to the Lord and we see him as he really is. My challenge for you this morning is simple. Study the Bible. Examine your life. Get real with God. Get real with the people around you and you will spread the aroma of Christ. Amen. Amen.